Hello, listeners. I am talking with Kathy Brennan, who is located in Baltimore, Maryland. And Miss Brennan is the founder and a trustee of a new church, which has made the news. Uh, rather than tell listeners about it myself, uh, Miss Brennan, do you care to describe the name of the church and uh, and why it was founded? Sure, Jonathan. Thanks. Um, and just to to be clear, I'm a co-founder. There's six other women who who co-founded the church with me, and the church is called the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft. We're a um, uh, earth-based spirituality and witchcraft religion located in the United States with members in other countries and growing every day. So when I Googled the church, because uh, I'm old enough to still feel weird saying the word pussy. Uh, <laughs> I just, I, 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 that, now that changed a little bit because of Pussy Riot in, in Russia, because that obviously that was a band that had a very serious uh, political mission, and uh, of course we had pussy hats in, uh, in in marches, including here in Canada, which themselves became the subject of controversy, which we can talk about yeah. later. But so the word pussy, the, the idea of it being the name of a church, is isn't as weird now as it might have been ten or twenty years ago. But when I googled the name of your church, uh, I found I found two Google hits side by side. One was from the Christian Post attacking the idea of the Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft uh, as a lesbian church and, you know, that's sort of standard social conservative critique of uh, religion being co-opted by by pagans, as, as they would see you, I suppose. And then the very next hit was from an LGBT website which describe you uh, as a turf church. That, of course, uh, T-E-R-F, it's a... Uh, for listeners who don't know the term, it, it's, uh, I believe, trans-exclusionary radical feminist. The idea being that you're a church that doesn't like uh, transgender people. So, like, in the, in the same Google search page, you've got it coming from the right and from the left. Uh, peop- could you describe... Now, this, the social conservative attack is, is easy, easy to understand, but could you describe why your church is is being attacked by people uh, who some of whom identify as transgender? It's a great question. And I, I can only give you my observation of why. Um, I will note that there are many transgender people who have and do support us. Um, I speaking only for myself, I've been working on LGBT issues since you know, college and law school. I'm 47 now. So this is my community. Um, Over the last 10 years, there's been a push away from recognizing that transgender people could not physically actually change sex um, into this brave new world where a man can declare that he's a woman and he is female. So this is a radical shift that, you know, I've noticed just from being in the community and being a, uh, an activist in the community. So I would imagine that some of those people do not like the fact that we wholly reject the concept of gender identity as being meaningful to the experience of being female on this planet. So just to unpack that a little bit, um, your church, it, it identifies explicitly as being uh, lesbian in character. Is that correct? So the church is open to all females. So any woman or girl who reads the, the it, it says on our website how to join the church. Um, we come from a radical feminist perspective in our analysis of how the experience of being a woman or a girl is on this planet. So if that speaks to you, you would contact us and uh, we have a process for membership. So it's not actually just for lesbians. The just for lesbians part is in the leadership and who can vote for the leadership. So in order to be um, a voting member that votes for trustees, um, which are the women who run the church, you have to be a lesbian. Now we our members, 
who are not lesbians can vote on anything, everything else, but just the leadership of the church is limited to lesbians. So again, as um, I think you and I are in the same age category. Um, well, I've said how old I am, Jonathan. How I'm, old are you? I'm, I'm 49. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we I, are in the same category. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we might not be in the same political category. I Some people have accused me of being a conservative. I see myself more as a centrist. But certainly I would say that in terms of what I, my political experience uh, growing up, uh, in the in the nineties and the the aughts, a project like yours would have been controversial not so long ago, because people would have said this is essentially a political project. It's a gender identity project. Um, it's it's co opting the language of religion. These people have read too much Dan Brown, The Sacred Feminine, too many health food stores and witchcraft and that sort of thing. Uh, let's start with that critique first. Is this a genuine religious movement? Like, do you have conventional uh, religious rituals? And is, is there, um, do you have a, a, a theology? Uh, do you have priestesses, that sort of thing? We do. And I would uh, simply commend our website to you where we post numerous religious writings and chants. Um, so, um, I'm not sure who Dan Brown is. Is he the Da Vinci Code guy? Yeah, and I'm going to admit that <laughs> I'm, I've admitted my age. I'm also going to admit that I read the Da Vinci Code. And yeah, I, I'm I, sure I read the Da Vinci Code, but I'm quite sure that Dan Brown is is neither a woman nor a witch. So no, probably that's true. But definitely, let me give yeah, you the, I, the, the, the thumbnail. The, the 15 second explanation of how Dan Brown is relevant is is that in the Da Vinci Code, one of the main drivers of the plot is the, oh, the idea of yeah, the, the, the I, sacred I've feminine. I've read the Da Vinci Code. I, I, my, my response to, to that, I, I don't particularly care if, if people don't think it's a real religion. Like, it, it's not, we're not here to convince people that it's a real religion. Um, we've founded a church in accordance with Maryland law. We've obtained... Um, 501c3 status in accordance with federal law. If women read, you know, our manifesto or a woman manifesto, and if it speaks to them, they're welcome to join. If, so, if people, if people want to laugh at us and say we're crackpots, they're welcome to do that as well. Now, I should say the IRS isn't laughing at you. For the, no. At least according to this, he not. according to this headline in the Christian post, um, uh, the, in case you haven't read the Christian Post uh, this week. Oh, I have. <laughs> it says, IRS recognizes Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft. And uh, sincere question, like, what is that process like to get uh, tax authorities in the United States to to recognize your religious institution? Is it uh, Do they come and interview you? Is there a visit? Or is it all done uh, electronically? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I actually reached out to the reporter at the Christian Post because the headline is misleading. Uh, the IRS cannot and does not have the authority to recognize a religion or a particular religion as valid. That would be a violation of the First Amendment of the US Constitution. What the IRS does is determine whether such church, having applied for certain authority to be exempt from taxes, is entitled to that exemption. And in order to obtain that exemption, you you apply. And, and the, the process for doing this is very transparent. It's on the website. You fill out forms. And um, it, it does not involve an interview where they come to you. It's a matter of filing paperwork and the IRS becoming satisfied with your paperwork or not becoming satisfied with your paperwork. Okay. So let's move on to some of the more modern uh, gender politics overtones, uh, because so we mentioned this term turf, which has become strangely popular in the last uh, year or two, uh, trans exclusionary mm -hmm. radical feminist, and the the presumption behind the the term is that there is this political tension between uh, radical feminists uh, and 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 the transgender identity. Do you think? Let's start with the basic question. Do you think that that tension exists? And if so, to what extent is, is your church a response to that tension? 
So um, it's a great question. And the tension is not so much against radical feminists versus transgender activists. The tension is between um, what it means to be a woman and what it doesn't mean to be a woman. So if you look, and I can send this to you, in 2011, myself and another attorney, because I'm an attorney practicing in a few states in the United States, we submitted a letter to the United Nations Commission on Women that surfaced for the United Nations that there is a problem with laws intended to ban gender identity. Um, I can tell you wholeheartedly, and I've said this repeatedly over the years, and it has just been completely ignored, I do not support discrimination against transgender people. I think it's wrong to discriminate against a transgender person um, in employment and in housing and in public accommodations. What I think is also wrong is pretending that by virtue of asserting a subjective belief in who you are, that should trump material reality. So that is the tension. And what transgender activists have done, and they've done very successfully, um, since the early to mid 90s is they they've pushed this idea that gender identity is whatever I say it is and I can, I'll share this letter with you because it's quite stunning how circular this legal definition is so that letter which quite honestly I thought would not be terribly controversial because the the language in these bills is subjective and and easily recognized as meaningless to anyone with any kind of legal training, but also with anyone who can read words, because it's, it's just very silly language. This was greeted with enormous uh, backlash from so-called transgender activists. And it was at that point for me personally, I'm just speaking for me personally, that I realized that it, it's not enough to accept someone as a woman for social or legal reasons. You have to actually pretend that they are actually female and had never been male. And that was like a bridge too far for me. And so that led me personally to engage in, a, in activism to highlight this problem. So the tension really is not about radical feminists versus transgender activists. The tension is women are supposed to deny our reality in order to satisfy male desire. So let me follow up on that because I've um, I, I speak with no authority whatsoever on on the various typologies of feminism. Uh, in the past, I've probably uh, maybe sometimes even been critical or even snarky sometimes about uh, sure. the excesses of of, of uh, feminist activism, uh, like any good conservative. And <laughs> uh, but but in the last few months, I've found myself. St strangely drawn toward some radical feminist figures who have made some fairly trenchant critiques of the excesses of, of transgender activism. And by the way, I should say that the transgender movement is, is no different from any other movement. I mean, there's always an extremist fringe in any activist movement. Uh, and I certainly know many transgender people who are just as reasonable as any non-transgender people. It's, um, or cis, as the, the term has now been popularized. But one um, a woman named uh, Megan Murphy here in Canada, who uh, self-identifies as a radical feminist, I interviewed her about it, and she described radical feminism to me as one of its beliefs being that gender is a construct. It's a construct that operates to the detriment of women, uh, the institutionalized detriment of women. But I'm still puzzled by the idea that gender can be a construct, and constructs are, are subjective, and yet you're critiquing the transgender activists for asserting female identity as, as being based on a subjective experience, which they're going to criticize you for because they're saying, no, it's, it's, it's a reality inside my body. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a woman or I'm a man, depending on their identity. What is the radical feminist idea of what gender is? Is it objective or is it subjective? So I think Megan. Megan's description is accurate, but I would also elaborate on it to say gender isn't just a construct, it's a hierarchy. So gender is the lens through which we as humans are asked to organize the world. So 
this begins from the moment <laughs> that a woman finds out she's giving birth to a boy or a girl. I can simply tell you to Google gender reveal parties and you will see like what it looks like if you're having a boy, what it looks like if you're having a girl. Once the baby is born, you know, it continues. And these things are taken as normal and natural in the way it is, but there is nothing that says that the things that are stereotypically associated with male or female actually relate to being male or female. So that is all drag. Everything, everything beyond your body is drag. So I, you know, when transgender people say, in my brain, I feel like a woman, I do not dispute that. I do not dispute that that is how you feel. But that feeling is actually not a material reality of your body. And one of the things in the, the, in the gay movement, which I come out of, like I w am a lesbian activist, I am not like a radical feminist in the way that like many academics are, like it's just not my orientation. I came to, to radical feminism once I started looking more deeply at the transgender issue and then it was like, oh, there's this whole political framework for understanding this thing I kind of knew was, was not right. So, so that's, that's what gender is. Gender is very, very real in that we all operate with these understandings that we think women should be this way and men should be this way. You know, I, you know, I get called a dyke when I'm walking down the street because of how I look. If I looked more, quote, feminine, I would be called other slurs right? I'd be called, I don't have to repeat them. But like the type of gendered uh, harassment I get is based on my appearance. But I am just as, as much of a, of a woman as, you know, a woman as Megan Murphy. Let's, let's use Megan as an example, because she, it, from the pictures I've seen, is more stereotypically, quote, feminine. So we're both women. We have experiences in the world because of how the world views us through the lens of gender. But gender is, one, very real, and two, it's not a neutral, like, it's just a construct. It's a hierarchy where women are at the bottom. So would it be accurate to, uh, to express your radical feminist view uh, thusly, that, uh, that gender is a construct, but it acts in a very real way to enforce a hierarchy, and it's institutionalized, and you, you experience it from birth, and after years or decades of experiencing this hierarchy, you can't simply say to the world, oh, guess what? I'm switching teams, I'm switching constructs, and I insist on being treated in exactly the same way as if I had endured the hierarchy from the other side of it throughout my entire existence. Is, is that, am I getting it right? Yeah, I think that's fair. And just, just to point out, you know, the fact is, is that these men can say this because they are saying it. And there are literally, you know, hundreds of organizations that support them saying it. And I would assert that the reason they're able to say this is precisely because of gender. Like when we're talking about this dispute between radical feminists and transgender activists, make no mistake, the dispute is between women and men. Because the transgender activists who, you know, get the accolades, get the, like, covers of magazines, get the money, they're all men who say they're women. So, I w okay, that's another question I have because, uh, and again, I'm an outsider. I'm a, I have, like, the least amount of moral authority to speak about this in the current environment. I am a middle-aged, cishet, white male. Um, but I have noticed that although the term trans is used in a generalized form, there is this difference, and I don't know if, if, if you've noticed it, um, that, that trans women sometimes behave in, in a way that I would associate with the way men behave, uh, particularly in the activist arena where sometimes there's a lot of aggression. Um, uh, but the trans uh, men, I know, people who were born biologically, uh, female and become men, um, you don't see them behaving in that same sort of very aggressive, hyper-assertive way. Um, so to, to call them all trans or even 
even within the trans activist community, there is this weird divide, which I'm not sure I've seen people talk about that much, maybe because it emphasizes the fact that men and women have been socialized in a different way. Um, well, there, there are numerous radical feminists who have talked about this precisely. Um, so I, you know, it, this is actually a very large topic of conversation, but I would agree with you that it is a thing. Men and women are socialized differently and women who act outside of their socialization are punished for doing so. And men who act outside of their socialization are punished for doing so. And this is why, you know, I am a butch lesbian. I, I do not, you know, embrace butch as like a part of my identity, but I know that's how I'm perceived in the world. And I'm perceived as aggressive. I'm perceived as bossy, you know, things that, you know, may or may not be true, but I behave in ways that are associated with male behavior in some ways. And again, this comes back to the point about what gender is. Gender is not rooted in a reality of how a human should be on the planet. It's rooted in our expectation of how we should be. And on the other end, you have, you know, ex you know some of my favorite people growing up in the, you know, I was raised by gay wolves, I like to say. And like, they were very queeny men, very campy men who like were called faggot regularly, like they were punished also for stepping outside of like their gender expectation. So it is very disturbing to me um, when I hear people use this language of cisgender as if, it's, as if it's a real thing. What that language is attempting to do is to change the hierarchy and to say it's not women who are oppressed by gender, it's transgender people who are oppressed by gender. That's simply false. Like, that is not how it works. All of us are disadvantaged by gender because gender de de denies all of us our full humanity. The consequences of the gender hierarchy, I would posit, are more stark and significant for women because it results in us being led to believe that we are no better than a broodmare in many instances. We are no better than a servant. But I would also say it denies the full range of humanity to men um, because it denies men the, you know, feeling or the, the, the traits that are stereotypically associated with being a woman. So it hurts all of us. So I appreciate that when transgenderism started as an idea, it it's a good idea to say gender is garbage, but they aren't doing anything to subvert gender. They are affirming gender. They're just flipping um, the hierarchy aspect of it. Is there now a feeling within the politically active LGBT community that there is sort of this growing antipathy between lesbians and, and transgender people? Or is that just something that we see on Twitter uh, and blogs and that sort of thing? Or is that something that that is experienced within the... Um, the civic community of, you know, in, in Baltimore, where you live, uh, have, have you experienced it? Yeah, it, it's a great question. It is very real. Um, this was an issue in the 90s. So this this is not new. It, it, the, the discussion of it on the internet is, quote, new, but this, this issue has been around for a very long time. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's only now that you're seeing like these, these like very public discussions of it. But, you know, the first time I read the language in the gender identity bill in Maryland, I think it was in like 1997, I read it and I was like, oh shit, this is a problem. <laughs> like, I'm like, this is a problem. Um, and, I, you know, I'm, I'm a reasonably smart person. There are people who are much smarter than me. And, and if you read like, you know, Mary Daly had written about this, Janice Raymond had written about this, Alex Dobkin had written about this. Victoria Brownworth had written about it. Like, this is not a new thing. This has been going on for a while. Um, and you, if you look in the, the, in, in the, I think it was like the early to mid 
um, 2000s, like there was when Elizabeth Birch was the head of the human rights campaign, there was a lot of controversy that she was like, quote, transphobic. So this is not new. It's the language of it, like the language of turf is relatively new. The language of cisgender is relatively new. But this conflict between the material reality of what it means to be a lesbian and what it means to be a, quote, trans woman, that, that's been around for a long time. Uh, Megan Murphy, uh, self-described radical feminist from Vancouver, who we've discussed previously in the show. Uh, I interviewed her in Vancouver a few months ago, and she tells me that she she prefers not to use the word cis uh, to describe people who don't identify as transgender. Uh, is is that a term that that you prefer to avoid? I yeah, as I've already said, cis. Just gender is meaningless garbage, and I, I reject it wholeheartedly. Um, there is not a lesbian on the planet that is, quote, cisgender. If, if you look at their definition of what cisgender means, it means someone who, you know, whose behaviors and personalities align with their, you know, biology. Like, I'm a lesbian. Like, I'm supposed to be, based on gender, heterosexual. So, first of all, that's a thing. Um, second of all, what does it mean to be aligned, you know, in your mind with your body? Like, it requires just like plumbing the depths of someone's like personal feelings about themselves. To me, this seems to be an extremely invasive boundary violation into the private mind space of people. And if you want to call yourself transgender, you can call yourself whatever you want. If if someone wants to call themselves a woman, call yourself fine, whatever. The problem becomes when you tell me what I should think, how I should talk about myself and how I should talk about you. Then we have a problem. And that kind of problem is the problem I can avoid if we were just talking about conversation because I don't have to talk to anyone who's using that kind of language. The real problem and where the rubber hits the road on this issue is when you are using these ideas to impact public policy. And where this comes up most significantly is when you're deciding to house male prisoners in, in a female prison. So that's the problem. When you're deciding to house homeless males with homeless females, that's the problem. All this other stuff about like how I feel and all these stupid think pieces about how to talk to trans people, I honestly don't care about that stuff. Like whatever, like go associate with your own people and do your own thing. It's, it's when it hits this public policy where we're all supposed to be living together, they have indicated there is no compromise. And that is a, that is a, a bridge too far for me. Um, and that's, just to be clear, this is me speaking on behalf of me. The church has no position on any of this stuff except to say that gender identity does not speak to what it means to be a woman or a girl on this planet. So that last minute or two riff you delivered was was excellent. Um, but I guess one of the reasons I thought it was so excellent is because, uh, and this is something that made Megan Murphy bristle when I mentioned it, is like, there is a sort of accidental conservatism that that uh, that crosses over with radical the, the radical feminist outlook. Uh, I think a lot of social conservatives would say, "Thank you for saying that. Yes, men and women shouldn't be in the same uh, homeless shelter or uh, the same mental health facility. You know, someone who's been raped shouldn't be in the same facility as someone who has a penis and is." Uh, has been sexually active in their, throughout their entire life as a man, even if they've decided that they're now a woman. Does it ever make you or others um, uh, bristle a little bit when it's pointed out, as I guess I'm doing now, that there is what it, culturally at least seems like a conservative element to your argument? No, I I don't mind that at all. Um, I'm anti-pornography. I think pornography is uh, human rights abuse. Um, against women and girls. Um, I'm anti-polyamory. I think that is harmful to women. I think we do live in a rape culture where women's boundaries aren't respected. I think, you know, accepting a no as a full sentence, a full and complete sentence is essential to being able to live on the planet. So I could care less if people call me conservative. 
Um, I could care less about arguing with them and saying, this is why I'm liberal. Both of those terms have become meaningless um, in the face of what I view as, you know, the real issue, which is we live in a world that is structured to deny the full humanity of women and girls. And as a side effect of that, we're just denying the full humanity of men and boys. And I'm interested in actually full humanity for all women and girls and men and boys. So if that makes me a conservative, okay. I mean, I, if you Google my name, you can see the many and varied insults people have lobbed at me. Um, I'm actually still living my life as a happy person. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be, you know, conservative if that's what it means. The thing that I find funny is when conservatives, you know, are just as, you know, uh, stuck to their ideology as liberals and they get stuck in their own little tunnel. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I don't agree with everything you're saying either. Like, and you know what? The thing I do agree with is that everyone has the right to express their opinions, uh, but no one has the right to listen to your opinions. And certainly no one has the right to express their opinion to me in a way that is harmful to me because you will hear about it. <laughs> well, I feel like the Christian Post has you all wrong. Uh, did, they, did they interview you before they, they did their article? No, um, I, they attempted to call, um, but it wasn't at a time when we were able to, to speak. So I thought, you know, their article was whatever. I, 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 don't, I don't particularly care, you know, the, the articles in the LGBT, the, they're all silly and they all have their, their agendas. And that's how media works now. Um, I thought Peter Riley's pieces in Forbes were at least, you know, attempting to like describe and to be balanced. So I would, you know, commend both of his pieces to your readers if they want a third party view. I'd also commend our website and, you know, like people can make up their own minds and women, if they want to join us, we're open, please join us. So, so did you say that was Forbes magazine in which uh, his pieces appeared? Yes. Well, as, as usual, Forbes on the cutting edge of LGBT coverage. <laughs> I know it's um, so, so Peter Riley is someone who's fo followed me for quite some time. So he has a couple of pieces that discuss this issue and um, he, he's a very nice man. And, you know, I, I appreciate the space, even though it's in a publication you don't normally look to for these types of discussions. Well, look for your next call from fortune magazine and money sense, I guess it's uh, or Barron's. <laughs> Uh, okay, right. so uh, before we sign off, uh, you've mentioned the website a few times. Could you just uh, tell listeners what the URL is and uh, what the best way to get in touch would be? Yes, yeah, so the URL is www.pussychurchofmodernwitchcraft.com. Um, that's probably easiest. You can also look for us on uh, Twitter as pussy underscore church. Um, I will emphasize it's very important to do that specifically. Otherwise, you might get a bunch of pornography, which is very annoying, but that's the reality of the world we live in. So um, those are two ways. We're also on Facebook. We have Pussy Church of Modern Witchcraft on Facebook. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, this has been uh, Kathy Brennan speaking to us from Baltimore. And uh, best of luck with the new project and uh, with everything else. So take care. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Bye. Bye.